Chapter 4, The Boys Are Back in Town The prosecutors did not feel good about the condition of the case so far. U.S. attorneys Sherry Sykes, Rodney Pierce, and Paul Vaughn realized that the testimonies of the government's informants, the snitches, sounded less than credible. Like a bunch of trained seals, said one of the prosecutors shaking his head, lying whenever we toss him a fish. Liars are on command. Believable witnesses were needed to control the damage being done by the unbelievable witnesses. Reliable witnesses who weren't convicted killers, robbers, drug lords, extortionists, or racketeers. In other words, people who weren't habitual liars. So they called Patrick Coombs to the stand. Patrick Coombs was a former federal warden who had spent his entire working life with the Bureau of Prisons. A compassionate person, he had gotten his undergraduate degree in criminal justice because he wanted to make a difference. He enjoyed college life so much that he hung around for an extra three years, at the end of which he was awarded his master's degree in criminal justice. Recruited by the Bureau of Prisons, which was always on the lookout for smart people who could be slotted into the administrative positions, Coombs quickly discovered that making a difference was but a pipe dream. And the reality of prison was paying the piper, which meant prison was about retribution, not about rehabilitation. That's the way the inmates wanted it. Very few criminals wanted to be rehabilitated. In fact, they laughed at the goody two-shoes types who tried to help them. At first, Coombs felt as if he'd been betrayed, then realized he had betrayed himself. He had assumed the most criminals were the products of their environment, bad homes, lousy parents, poverty, poor education. In other words, he fell for the claptrap, the sociologists who were selling people weren't bad, they're just environment. Boy, that was wrong. The Bureau of Prisons made him an assistant warden and the training was on the job. The very first thing Coombs learned was this. There are bad people who make bad decisions and the bad people make bad choices because they want to. They like being bad. Lesson number two, inmates create their own environment. They are mean, violent, angry people who enjoy being mean, violent, and angry. They treat other people like shit because life is shit, cheap shit. To most inmates, life was to be abused, thrown away, and murdered. They lived in a brutal setting in which they only really felt alive when they were taking the life of another person. Murder was a rush. Murder got them high like crystal meth. It made them feel good. They liked it that way, so they made it that way. Coombs learned there were a lot of things wrong with the penal system, but the real problem was the inmates, the wild beast within it. Sarté was right. Hell was on other people. And prison was hell full of hellish people. From that point on, Coombs never again thought of himself as making a difference. Instead, he was a lion tamer in a circus. His job was to snap the whip and poke the chair at the lions, making them perform tricks that were unnatural to them. Tricks such as acting like human beings and not brutalizing one another. The trick of being housebroken. Coombs took the witness stand. He raised his right hand and took the oath. A gray-haired, wrinkled man in dark gray suit and white shirt, he sat and waited patiently for the questions. The Aryan Brotherhood were a constant problem at the prison, as they were and continue to be at most federal facilities. Could you please tell the jury why the Aryan Brotherhood were a problem? Because of their proclivity for violence, said Coombs. The Aryan Brotherhood's goal was to control the inmate population. To do that, they employed terrorist tactics. They were the most violent monsters I had ever seen. The prosecutor nodded. In 1983 at Leavenworth, do you recall the murder of Richard Andreasen, whose nickname was Rhino? Yes, distinctly. I witnessed it, replied Coombs. Would you please tell the jury what you witnessed? I saw two inmates with 12-inch knives attack and repeatedly stab Mr. Andreasen. They would thrust these knives not only into his body, but all the way through his body. They were hitting the concrete underneath his body with the knives. I tried to intervene and stop it. One of the murderers attacked me and tried to stab me. Can you identify the two inmates with the knives? Greshner and Chriswell, said Combs emphatically. J. 
John Greshner and Ronnie Joe Griswell, both of whom were members of the Aryan Brotherhood. What happened then at Sherry Sites? A response team of prison guards arrived and subdued the two inmates with the knives. Coombs paused, then looked at the jury. After being subdued, Greshner was licking the blood off his hands and laughing about it. The jurors stared at Coombs, and then their eyes glanced across the courtroom to where Barry, the Baron Mills, and Tyler, the whole Bingham, sat like two stones in a garden. No further questions, the prosecutor told the judge. The defense attorneys were whispering to one another. Any cross-examination, asked the judge. Not at this time, replied Montgomery. The people called Al Benton, who was the government's star witness. Albert Skinny Benton was anything but skinny. Large and meaty, Skinny stood three inches over six feet. His skin had a moist sheen to it, as if he was too warm all the time. A longtime zealous member of the Aryan Brotherhood and the brand to prove it, Skinny had decided to roll over on his fellow warriors. His reason was simple. He wanted out of prison. He was sick and tired of being locked in a 48 square foot cement box day after day, and snitching was the only way it would ever happen. Convicted of a double murder, Skinny was down for 63 years, which meant the rest of his life. He'd never get out alive, but if he testified, things would change. In exchange for his testimony, Skinny would be allowed to plead guilty to assault instead of getting hit with a third murder charge. Additionally, Skinny's sentence of 63 years would be reduced to 9 years. He'd be out in no time at all. Albert wasn't inbred, but he fitted the bill on the other two items. Albert's father, George, was a violent alcoholic. The more George drank, the meaner he got. And because he drank, George couldn't hold a job, which made him drink even more. His wife, Henny, hated George with a passion that burned white hot. A holy hatred, but she was a strict Lutheran and wouldn't divorce him. Henny owned a small grocery store that sold cheap, fattening food beer, cigarettes, and dirty magazines. The way Henny saw it was that most people were destined for hell anyway, so she sold them what they longed for and eventually purchased a mobile home on two acres just outside of town. She wanted to protect her small boys, Albert and George Jr., from the influence of sin and ungodliness. Albert only left the trailer to attend school, then he had to come right home. He wasn't allowed any friends over, and was warned against riffraff and scum. He spent most of his time in small room, reading or caring on imaginary conversations with imaginary friends. Haney demanded perfection from her two boys. She preached daily sermons to them about the depravity of the world and the evil of the devil's brew, alcohol. All women, according to Haney, were prostitutes sent by the devil to tempt men into sin. Haney excluded herself, of course, to counteract these evils, Henry read the Bible to her sons for two hours every day. She chose explicit passages from the Old Testament to drive her point home. Passages that spoke of the evils in men's hearts, murder, divine punishment, and the final judgment of the great white throne. Albert was a late bloomer. He didn't start to grow until he was a teenager, which meant that as a child, Albert was small and prissy and bullies picked on him, calling him Nancy Boy and Sweet Stuff. Albert tried to defend himself, but he was a lousy fighter and got beat up on a regular basis. Arriving home bloody and bruised, Henny warned him of the result of his sinful ways. The sign of Cain is upon you, she told Albert. You're destined for hell and the wrath of God, just like your father. Albert believed her. George Benson died of a heart attack when Albert was a senior in high school. That's what the doctor said it was, a massive heart attack. But Albert knew it was the alcohol and divine justice from God. By that time, Albert and his brother, George Jr., were powerful young men. They had part-time jobs and Albert pumped iron every afternoon at a local gym. George Jr. rebelled against his mother. He thought she was crazy, telling Albert she was a Jesus freak. Always thumping her Bible and screaming about backsliding and going to hell. Albert couldn't believe it. Hey, y'all don't be talking about your own mother like that, he told his brother. George scowled. The fuck you say? Don't be telling me what to do. Mama's boy, or I'll kick your sorry ass for you. The two brothers glared at each other. A few weeks later, Albert came home from the gym. He asked his mother where George was. 
Henny didn't know. He'll be back soon, I'm sure, she said. The next morning, Albert informed the police his brother was missing. George was discovered dead in a ditch. There were no signs of a struggle and no marks on the body, but the autopsy revealed he had died of a broken neck. There was a police investigation, but no arrests were made. George was buried at the local cemetery, the Lutheran priest presiding, and life went on. Albert lived with Hanny until she died of cancer and then alone in the mobile home, working part-time in construction. He began reading goth and extreme metal signs and also white supremacist literature, which warned against the rising tide of color in the white world, an ocean of color that will one day wash away our white way of life. Albert Benton became a suspect in the murder of Jackson Johns, an African American who worked at a local factory. The police found the decapitated body of Johns buried behind Benton's mobile home. The dead man's rib cage had been split and the heart cut out. The cause of death was two 45 caliber bullets to the back of the head. Armed with the search warrant, the police entered Albert's trailer to find one 10 inch Bowie knife, which was bloody a 45 semi-automatic pistol with five boxes of ammunition for the pistol. Albert was arrested and tossed in the jail. The pistol was discovered to have been stolen from a gun shop in Florida, which resulted in the FBI taking interest. Albert escaped while being transported from jail to the courthouse, overpowering two FBI agents and taking one of their guns with him. He needed money to get out of town and out of Arkansas, and he used the gun, a 9mm Glock, to rob a Bank of America. A loan officer tried to intervene and Albert broke the man's neck, killing him. The police showed up and were forced to wound Albert before they could arrest him. At his trial, Albert was convicted of two counts of first degree murder. Albert's attorney, who was a smooth talker, persuaded the jury of mitigating circumstances and that Albert Benton does not deserve the death penalty. Mitigating circumstances was a euphemism for the fact Albert's mother had been a nutcase and had pretty much raised her sons to be nutcases too. Two psychiatrists testified that it wasn't really Albert's fault, but rather Henny's fault. He had killed two men and robbed a bank. The jury couldn't agree whose fault it was. They found Albert guilty, but not guilty enough to condemn him to death. The judge sentenced Albert to 63 years in federal prison. He was taken to USB Lewisburg, where he was welcomed by the Aryan Brotherhood with open arms. Within a few months, Albert was branded, a green shamrock on his hand and 666 on his shoulder. The mark of the beast, 666, the enemy of God in the Bible. Albert's fellow warriors christened him skinny. Being part of the Aryan Brotherhood was almost like being a Lutheran. Failure to adhere to its strict commandments resulted in quick punishment, which was usually death. Albert felt at home. He loved prison. As Al Skinny Benton was escorted to the witness stand, the defense attorneys for Barry the Baron Mills and Tyler the Hulk Bingham believed the courtroom battle was going their way. They had discussed it the night before. Mark Montgomery summed it up when he told Frank Sansoni, in order for the government to prevail, the Bureau of Prisons is going to have to concede that they were incompetent and screwed up. That's an enormous problem in the prosecution's camp right now. They don't want to admit that they couldn't control the people they were supposed to be controlling. Sansoni nodded his agreement. You're right, he said. And you don't forget that we've been able to discredit almost every single one of their witnesses. Yes, yeah, smiled Montgomery. We'll keep the pressure on. Sooner or later, it will implode. Across the way, at the prosecutor's table, the U.S. assistant attorneys were feeling equally confident. Warden Coombs' testimony had been especially gratifying. Another nail pounded in the coffin. That the witness for the government was about to question Al Skinny Benton should hammer in a few more nails, making it pretty much airtight. There was one other big gun in the government's arsenal of weapons, the language of the RICO statute. RICO was written in such a way that the beauty of it subtly almost blinded anyone who read it. The subtlety was this. Once a plot was proven, conspiracy law required that the co-conspirators show there was no crime. In other words, the prosecutors only had to prove that the Baron and the Hulk had plotted to have inmates murdered. They did not have to prove who the murderers were. Just proof of the plot would do the trick, 
and the trick was the death penalty for Barry Mills and Tyler Bingham. The burden was now on the defense attorneys, Sansoni and Montgomery, who had to prove there was no plot and no murders. If they couldn't show that, the Baron and the Hulk were peering down the long, dark tunnel of death. Sherry Sykes stood and walked toward the witness. In the docket, under the shadow of black clad marshals, sat Barry, the Baron Mills, and Tyler, the Hulk Bingham. The Baron wore his cheap black sunglasses, which gave him the appearance of a venomous spider. Taking a last glance at her notes, the prosecutor began, Mr. Benton, are you currently incarcerated? Yes. And for the purpose of clarification, are you a member of the Aryan Brotherhood? Not no more, replied Al Skinny Benton. But you were a member of the Aryan Brotherhood, were you not? Yes. Were you a member of the Aryan Brotherhood in 1997? Yes. And at that time, 1997, you were incarcerated in the Federal Penitentiary in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania? Yes. Mr. Benton, please think back. 